Welcome back to Black Cat Crypto Club. Guys, this week I am lucky enough to have Sam and Andy back with us. We're going to jump into a few topics um, surrounding the yen trade that is kind of an on ongoing uh, issue with all the markets right now. And we are also going to talk about Bitcoin becoming a flight to safety asset instead of trading like a risk on asset, which it kind of has always traded like. So, um, yeah, jump over here. Welcome, Andy, Sam. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here with me. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Drake. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, so the first thing I had, I just had kind of a quick thought this week really with the yen trade and you know according to you know a few reports that i've seen like jp morgan has come out and said that uh we're really only about halfway unwound from the carry trade which makes sense because there's a, still a huge arbitrage difference in our rates right so there's a difference in markets between the us dollar interest rate right now which is 5.5 percent and i believe the yen is at their their they hiked rates from zero to 0.25 is that right sam do you know we don't know the exact number okay um no, it was a minuscule raise it was what i gathered was one it was point one it was like right about there and they only went to 0.25 so it wasn't it didn't seem you know in the in the figure that dramatic but the fallout right. was pretty pretty big right yeah and it's just people either leverage being knocked out that in in that kind of arbitrage area or people are unwinding because they see that the yen is going up in interest rates and the dollar is about to come down. Um, but a, a, according to JP Morgan, we're only about halfway unwound from that. But, you know, we've, we've seen CPI come out this week, which was finally under 3%. I think CPI came out at 2.9% for the first time since probably 2021 or 2022 or so. Um, but I, I was watching this unfold and I was watching a few others with their news and their videos. Um, and everybody was really excited that the, that, you know, we're getting rate cuts. And I think eventually that is going to be the thing. It's going to bring liquidity into the market. And a lot of that money is going to come into crypto and risk on assets like it usually does. However, initially where we have this, this uh, carry trade right now, I think, you know, anything signaling that we are heading to rate cuts for the dollar is going to unwind that that yen carry trade is that and i i think we kind of saw that because uh it was wednesday when cpi came out and I, it was funny because all of all of the people that i was watching were like cpi came out really low why is bitcoin going down so bad today you know because we did see right after cpi came out bitcoin and us markets and everything really fell and in my mind that was more of the yen trade unwinding but what are what are your thoughts sam on on that am i well, am i crazy for thinking that rate cuts of initially are going to drop us rate cuts in the united states will mean that more people will be able to get their hands on U.S. dollars in loans. So right. that will increase the money supply. So what you see right now is the, the world market is in the process of transitioning from getting cheap yen 
Mm. Now we're going to begin to start getting cheap dollars. As the yen rates go up, there will be less yen flowing into the world markets. As the U.S. rates come down, there will be more U.S. dollars flowing into the markets. So really, we're kind of switching riders, if you will. We're switching horses right, right now. Yeah, it so, looks like a kind of a baton pass between the markets. And if I understand correctly, Sam, isn't there um, a few more levers that the Japanese government has to pull to be able to stabilize their market? Well, the the stock market, um, yeah, they're going to have to come up with something different because think about the money that people are borrowing in yen, well, where do you park that money once you own it? Suppose you go out and you borrow $100 million in yen. Okay, well, now you have $100 million in your bank account. You can't afford to just let that sit there and do nothing. So yen borrowers are parking that money in the Nikkei, the stock exchange, in money market accounts, in commodities. So in or that's why the stock market in Japan dropped so radically when the Japanese bank increased their reserve rates because all that borrowed free money, that zero interest borrowed yen, that's coming to an end. Well, all that money that was borrowed while it's in transition of being used, put to use, whatever the ultimate goal of that loan is in Japanese yen, a lot of it gets parked in the stock market. So there, you're buying uh, stock you're market. Buying stocks. I think undeniably we saw it in crypto as well, right? Exactly. That's exactly correct. So. Let me ask you this, um, as far as wash trades go, if, if I were borrowing money in the yen right now, or for the last year or two years, and I, I had bought Bitcoin with this borrowed yen, if I'm seeing that rate um, exchange close, that arbitrage starting to close, and I wanted to get out of my loan in yen so i sell bitcoin i pay back my loan in yen but ultimately i want to go back into bitcoin whether i'm borrowing in dollars or however i'm doing it as far as wash trades go it's just a tax thing right so if i if i cash out of bitcoin if i don't want to be um I don't know how do, how does that work with a wash trade? I know I ha I would have to technically wait 30 days before I bought back into the exact same asset otherwise I'd have um I believe short ter short term capital gains tax to pay on that, right? What's the wash trade, Drake? Don't you don't know what, what the wash trade is? Okay, so mm -hmm. a wash trade is is basically that like if i'm if i'm trading in and out of bitcoin let's say or any asset really if i if i cash out of bitcoin today and i buy right back in under 30 days that that is a taxable event if i believe if if you do that within 30 days you have to pay short-term capital gains tax on on whatever trade you just made. So in my in my thinking, a lot of these people that are getting out of the yen uh, their yen uh, loans might take some time because ultimately I think that money flows back into the assets where which it came unless it's just leverage getting wiped out because that's completely just 
lost money or completely changing hands and could go into something else. But generally, if somebody's getting out of something just because of a loan that they're trying to arbitrage, usually they'll take that money and get back into the same assets that they're interested in, in investing in. But because of this wash trade, and I don't, I don't know if this is the same everywhere in the world, but in the U S if you buy, if you cash out, you have like a 30 day wait period before you can technically buy back in or it's, you know, you have some tax Im implications there. Um, that are usually, you know, not good because I don't, I don't know. Um, but that's, that's what I'm kind of anticipating is, you know, it's the kind of the same thing with, with the Bitcoin ETFs, the, the people that have been in grayscale, their trust and had, you know, basically Bitcoin or Ethereum in grayscale trusts. Once it became an ETF, a lot of the people that are staying with, um, with grayscale, despite their large fees are doing so because they don't want to cash out and have that taxable event. But the ones that do cash out of grayscale, you don't see that money come out of Bitcoin and go straight back into Bitcoin um, with little effect. When we see a lot of selling with grayscale, they have to keep their money out for like 30 days. Otherwise it becomes a, a wash trade and kind of hurts them tax wise. So that's, I'm kind of expecting the same, same thing with the yen carry trade. People selling their Bitcoin positions would not be rebuying back in for at least 30 days. That's, that's what I'm expecting. I don't know. So I guess what I'm gathering, Drake, and maybe I'm overlooking something, but if they bought in with leverage, meaning they borrowed in yen to, to be able to buy the Bitcoin, they see the carry trade issue, they cash out, they still need a low interest currency to buy back in with because, right, wouldn't it, wouldn't it not yeah. make sense to go back in in yen? So it, we haven't dropped the, the rate yet at least in US dollars. So potentially yep. if they have a different currency, they can, you know, shift over, wait the 30 days and back in. <clears throat> but if if that is correct and they go to dollars, they're going to be hurry up and waiting to see, you know, what and how many points we decide to lower. We go this. down. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I don't think, you know, the 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 yen carry trade is not unwound at all but uh, you know at, at, to to the extent that it could because there's still such a huge difference in interest rates between the dollar and the yen um and i i don't know that's that's why i see i actually see uh rate cuts in the u.s being a short-term downside to markets you know, usually we, we cut rates and it's like a, a stimulant for the markets and everybody mm -hmm. gets excited and like pe more people are borrowing, more money is, uh, you know, entering the markets at, at lower rates and markets usually react to the upside uh, with that. But because of the yen carry trade, I think we have a little bit of the opposite. Maybe, maybe they kind of equal out, you know, the the unwinding of the yen people are going to be selling and getting out of their positions that they've borrowed in the yen in cryptocurrency or or the US stock market or whatever and maybe it's offset by new money coming in because of low rates but it's hard for me to see like the rate cuts this time being an immediate like jump in prices in a lot of things if that makes sense I'm, yeah i got a question for you guys in that space is how um where does you know turning on the money printers um sit within you know we we lower rates you know i've heard you know 
loosely that they're going to start printing more money, more money in circulation. You know, like at, at what point do those do those happen? We start with rate cuts and then. Um, yeah. You know, Sam, maybe you're probably more knowledgeable about this, but I I think, you know, printing money is just basically. Um, I mean, on one front, at least, you know, having rates lowered, you get more people borrowing and the Fed has to print money because people are taking them up on that rate. Right. Yeah. Look, the way money comes into creation is the Federal Reserve is the bank for the banks. Okay, so every bank has an account with the Federal Reserve Bank. And they have a certain amount of money in their account at the Federal Reserve. Then that bank who owns the money in the Federal Reserve can then start loaning on a fractional reserve basis, which means if you have a million dollars in the bank, the bank can loan say $20 million out. So when, when you say rates come down, it's, there's also a factor of the, the reserve rate. So turning on the money supply means banks are making more loans against right. their reserves in the Federal Reserve. So money and, is in on one front, money is printed to meet that loan demand. Right. That's so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say money is printed, it it's more accurate to use a general term. Money is created. Right. They don't yeah. physically print all the money. But, you know, when you go into a bank and you borrow money to buy a car or a house. That the bank is creating that money, right? We're just adding a few zeros to the balance sheet. Exactly. Okay. I didn't want to make the assumption, you know, this is just one of the gaps in my knowledge is, you know, you always hear this term, oh, we're going to print more money. Well, how does that tie into, and you guys just kind of cleared up that gap for me. So thank you. I mean, that's, I think that's one, one way that money is created um the other is kind of i mean another i'm i'm sure there's some that i'm not even thinking about but like what we saw during covid when they sent everybody out a check for twelve hundred dollars or whatever um that was like a conscious decision on the side of you know the treasury and the national government and and all of them and that was a major money printing expedition as well. Yes. Okay. For the federal government, the way the federal government gets money is by selling securities, selling bonds. Through bonds, like treasury bonds and war bonds, correct? Exactly. And the entity that is buying those bonds is the Federal Reserve. Foreign okay. governments also yeah, buy yeah. those. Right? So the Chinese government is getting a ton of money from us. They have a pot, the net positive uh, trade imbalance with the United States. The Chinese government has tons of extra U.S. dollars that we're sending them to buy toasters and microwaves and bicycles. They take that U.S. currency and they buy treasury bonds. Now they're yep. getting interest on top of their yeah on okay. top of their asset. Their asset is a U.S. dollar. Well, they don't want the U.S. Um, well, it's great to have a pile of U.S. dollars, but how about living on the interest from those U.S. dollars? Great. Okay, so the federal government is raising money by taxation and the sale of bonds. The major buyer of U.S. Treasury bonds is the Federal Reserve. 
and the Federal Reserve is creating the money with the stroke of a pen. The Federal Reserve creates money. So they go in, they buy $100 million of treasuries. The Federal Reserve is now collecting. And interest. that's creation of, of money right there. So instead of, right instead of creating money to lend out to the public, they're creating money to buy bonds that the government yeah. is, is basically borrowing created money. That is exactly correct. And then the federal government can do whatever it wants with that money. If you need to finance a war, if you need to finance a social program, if you need to finance the salaries of your uh, government employees if, and contractors. If you, if you need to pay the interest payment on the national debt. Yes. <laughs> like the, the in interest payments alone on the national debt are now over 75% of taxes collected. So the federal government has to collect taxes, but they also have to create a lot of new money by selling bonds. So the creation of money for the government's use, remember taxes are not created money. Taxes are a percentage of money in circulation, transactions, right? Creation of government money comes from selling the bonds. The Federal Reserve writes a check, gives it to the federal government. And now the Federal Reserve owns treasuries. That's an asset. The federal government has new money. The Federal Reserve has asset. That asset is now in the deposit of a federal bank. And the federal bank uses what's called a fractional reserve. So you own a hundred million dollars of UST bills. You can now loan out a multiple of that. Like 10 times that or whatever. Yeah. Commercial clients, right? So if you see a huge construction company down the road, taking out a loan, a commercial loan to build huge real estate developments. They're borrowing money from that bank. The bank is creating that money to get them. Well, the bank can only create that money as a multiple of its reserves in the Federal Reserve Bank. And those reserves in the Federal Reserve Bank are government securities. <laughs> that they purchased with money they created with the stroke of a pin. It's... So you buy securities by creating money. The created money goes to the government. The securities are now in your Federal Reserve bank account, and you can create commercial loans on a multiple of that. So let's, let's just use a number of a million bucks. The federal government gets a million dollars from the Federal Reserve. And then that million dollars is now security or collateral for $20 million worth of commercial loans and even consumer debt loans. So people buying houses, people buying cars, people buying vacations on a credit card, real estate developers, new businesses, all those private sector loans are secured by U.S. Treasuries. A million dollars worth of U.S. Treasuries, that's a million dollars of government money. That million dollars of Treasuries will now produce $20 million of commercial and private loans. It's a huge house of cards, basically. And that's why we're, we've seen, uh, like, residential or uh regional banks failing because of that that uh commercial real estate plunge that we've seen because of covid and people working at home and whatnot but yeah it 
it seems like a house of cards that just could come down. It's still confusing at, to me. At, yeah, like, and just, and it is confusing, I think, on purpose almost, you know, like... Yeah, I mean, I know it's opaque on purpose, but basically, people, Sam, where I'm trying to understand this whole thing, I'm thinking you just need to put together a Federal Reserve 101 course for dummies, and I will be your first subscriber, because <laughs> I still don't have it, but... Um, I know that with time, like it'll start to to make a little more sense to me because essentially, you know, what is Bitcoin and why does it have? And so my thing is, it's Bitcoin versus the dollar and understanding both of them helps, you know, kind of point the compass in one direction or the other. Yeah, the right. U.S. dollar is a debt instrument. It's a debt instrument. Think about in order to create a U.S. dollar, the Federal Reserve has to buy a uh, treasury. The federal government is paying interest to the Federal Reserve now. The Federal Reserve has the power to create money. The federal government does not. The federal government has to either borrow money or collect taxes. The only place the federal government can borrow money is through selling is through selling securities and paying interest on those. The Federal Reserve has the right to create money out of nothing, literally create the money. And what the so Federal Reserve does is buy government securities that's what they do so essentially society is completely in debt to the federal reserve it's a it's a control mechanism it's a controlled money system where we will always owe as a society we will always owe the the federal reserve and so we've they've kind of got us wound around their finger, you know, running on this hamster wheel, like you you said, Andrew. That's how I see it, anyway. Sure. Well, when you've got a money instrument, a financial instrument that is interest bearing from the point of its creation, origin, yeah. Yeah, then by definition, you can never have enough of that asset to pay off the debt. If you create a million dollars, well, then tomorrow you're going to owe a million and one dollar. And the day after that, you're going to owe a million and two dollars. So by having the Federal Reserve create this money and the federal government paying interest on it from that second. Well, then you, you're always owing more than you have. And then that filters down to the commercial banks as well, because when the commercial banks make a loan based on those treasury that they own, um, that money is created with interest as well. When you take out a home loan for, say, $200,000, the interest starts immediately. The next day you owe 201,000, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So every dime of US currency in existence is interest bearing from the point of its creation, which means right. we can never really pay off the debt to your right. point, right? And when you call it a control mechanism, I would say the fact that it works the way it does represents that the control is already in place why yeah. why would you why would you pay interest to someone constantly for an asset that you need um, if you weren't under their control why not just create it yourself someone's creating money right why why would well, the federal government create the money yeah i mean yeah we're definitely the control is there because it exists um but i think another facet of it is it keeps us 
as a society, it's it's kind of the dog eat dog thing that keeps us competing against each other because I can pay back my loan. If I hustle enough and I, you know, make enough money, I can repay my loans, but not everybody can. And, you know, society as a whole never will be able to. So we're, we're constantly running that hamster wheel, trying to be able to pay back this debt when it's kind of a rigged game socially. Yeah, that's exactly right. Not everyone can pay off their debt. So the the key word there is competition. People are competing for scarce resources and they're at risk of losing everything that they have because they're in debt. The the debt is securitized and by There's the nothing question. that can control people more than that. The risk of losing yeah. everything. Yeah, every single person is on a debt hamster wheel under the threat of loss of everything, literally. So I guess, you know, where are we headed? You know, there's these talks of potential recession. There's talks of lowering interest rates, um, you know, the next year, uh, two years, right? Very curious what your guys' opinions are. You know, we are in that exciting part of the having cycle where things are going to start to shift there. But, you know, with us, you know, our economy obviously showing signs of weakness, therefore we're going to lower the interest rates. However, we have Bitcoin sitting at this doorstep of, of, of growth. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if we go into recession or not, but it's like, you know, I, I know I expressed this theory to you guys, but if we go into recession and we've had that Bitcoin having that we are still, in my opinion, yet to see that kind of supply crunch that we normally see. Yeah, if we go into right. recession, I think it would be odd for us to go into recession because we are about to start, you know, lowering rates, printing money and, you know, global liquidity has been increasing. And I think it is, is forecasted to, to keep increasing for the next little while. So in my opinion, you don't usually have a recession when money supply is expanding. But let's just, for the argument's sake, um, say that we do go into recession. We do still have that supply crunch on Bitcoin. If we start going into depression or recession in the U.S. economy and Bitcoin is just buoyed by that supply crunch that finally kicks in, usually around September or, or no, you know, September, October, November of the having year. If Bitcoin remains strong while the economy goes down, people are going to take notice of that. And maybe that's the point when people start seeing it as that escape hatch or flight to safety or, you know, you know, it finally becomes a risk trading like a risk off asset when when things are uncertain and the the economy go, is going down. People are actually seeking out gold and Bitcoin, possibly. I mean, that could be the catalyst, in my opinion, for for Bitcoin really turning into a flight to safety asset. I agree completely. And, you know, people like us who understand Bitcoin and understand the value proposition of Bitcoin um, already see it as a flight to safety and we're using it as a flight to safety. Um, however, in that bridging the gap time, when you see the adaptation of a new technology or a new product, 
you get the early adopters, that's us. Then you get this kind of waiting period before the mainstream um, kind of learns the, the new asset or the new, new technology and becomes comfortable with it. I think that's where we are right now. Yeah, I think learning learning about Bitcoin and really learning kind of that those first principles on what Bitcoin fixes is going to be a huge part of it becoming a flight to safety also because if you know, you know, the first principles of Bitcoin and like how how it fixes this monetary system problem that we have and so many other problems honestly, once you know that, I mean, for me, Bitcoin, as soon as I was introduced to it, it was my flight to safety because I, I knew all of that stuff. So I think really learning about it and like knowing that it does fix these problems for the, you know, for the masses, for the majority of people out there, when it becomes not, not an investment, but that escape hatch from from our traditional screwed up money system that's also going to have to be a thing where it becomes a a flight to safety yeah so there's education and awareness on the part of the we'll call them the person on the street the average person right they need to learn then there's also a proliferation of the types of transactions you can do with Bitcoin. We need that ease and convenience and proliferation of uses, right? So then uh, maybe. number three. I mean, you don't yeah, have that. Yeah. You don't have that with gold. Like it's use, use and transaction of gold is not really very easy to transact in. Um, yeah. So I don't think that's necessarily as important as like, you know, really understanding the underlying functions and, and uh, you know, principles. like, principles. yeah, principles and all of that of, of Bitcoin. I think that's much more important than, than ease of use and transactions yes. but that yes. would be that would definitely help it as well that's point taken drake very very true you got to kind of prioritize those factors and then gentlemen the big elephant in the room is existential threats to u.s citizens using bitcoin it really I mean, you can say the the insiders today understand the principles of Bitcoin, right? And we understand that it is a flight to safety. But the other shoe that could drop is U.S. federal regulatory action. And right now, it's enough to make you nervous. There's that $15 billion of Silk Road coin sitting out there. And then you've got a, the federal government could regulate or legislate or take so some is, action. That is this affects, where you tell me I need to go vote? Uh, yeah. <laughs> vote for RFK Jr. He's the only <laughs> one who gets it. So let's. All right, I got a. I got a couple of things here. I've just been over here brewing. All right. So, um, when it comes to the the government and the fear of of them shutting it down, yeah. You know, I think up to this point, it's been a game of could a game of whack a mole. You know, you say, see what China did, right? And they're already about to backpedal on mining. And so because of the decentralization and the power that the network already has, I am in this position now where I believe that, you know, you, you whack this mall in the United States and it's going to pop up heavier in Canada or in Mexico or in 
you know, we see in South America where so many other countries are adopting this thing. So um, I believe, you know, today that it's not in their best financial interest to push all of these people out because the adoption base that we have in our country is huge, but also, um, the, you know, those people that believe as strongly as we do, you know, their flights to safety will be to go where it's accepted. Right. I don't think they and, want that. And companies, you know, the U.S. has already seen innovation and companies start going overseas. And I think they're starting to realize that they can't do that. Um, yeah. And I think just this week, I saw a statement from uh, the House leader, Chuck Schumer, and he was saying, you know, to to basically his party, like Elizabeth Warren and whatnot, crypto is here to stay, is what Chuck Schumer said himself, and that we need to we need to embrace it. We need to have we need to lead in that sector in technology and bring that that innovation and money and um, what it can do for the economy to the U.S instead of forcing it elsewhere. So I don't know, in my opinion, I think we're at a, a turning point because we have seen a lot of hostility towards Bitcoin. And I think there's still some residual stuff going on, especially with Elizabeth Warren. I don't think she'll ever, I don't know. I think she has her heels so dig, dug in and so anti-crypto that it'll be hard to turn her. But I think as far as like the Senate and the House, there is, has been a lot of change the last two years and a lot of positivity coming in that sector of the government anyway. And so I think, I don't know, my fear of the government like all out banning it or, you know, having unrealistic regulations is a lot less for me. I, I fear that a lot less than I did back in like 2014 under Obama. Like I saw all of this happening and I was like, the government cannot love this thing. And so I was pretty fearful back then. And I feel like now it's, I, I just don't see them doing it. I think they, I think they, they are starting the to realize. Yeah. It's, be, it's too big 2014, now. 2015, they had a shot. But now that we have tens of thousands of nodes running all over the world to secure this network. It, and they just approved ETFs. So yeah, they've they, legitimized it themselves. Yeah, that's huge. So Andy, your conclusion, I agree completely. Like the unfolding that the potentialities for real U.S. government plant downs or crackdowns, never mind all that. It's not going to work, and they're probably not going to even try it. However, we still have that perception hangover. We are the early adopters. We can see through the haze, through the fog of where we are now, and we can really predict, like you just did, you know, um, an outcome. It, it's going to be fine. Bitcoin is going to be fine. It's not going to be regulated. It's not going to be legislated out of existence for U.S. citizens. We can see that. But we're waiting for the average person, if you will, the person on the street to see that. And all that person on the street who's not an early Bitcoin adapter, all the press they've been seeing for the last years is uh, SEC sues this, SEC sues that. So we're really in that. Remember when there was the BlackBerry phone and then the iPhone, the push button, you know, we're in that adoption of a new technology, a new methodology, a new product. We're the early adapters. Well, here, here's, you know, kind of coming back to one of the other things I wanted to mention is, 
we need to define this issue. And I think, you know, when you talk to people about it, it's like, I can sit there and tell you how rad it is that, that Bitcoin is, you know, it's not a dollar, it's permissionless, it's, you know, it's all of these things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, finding that way for the masses to start to understand it to the level that the monetary system and the monetary policy is working against them and that is broken, I think is, you know, probably one of the biggest shifts in my perception is, is knowing why I'm here and having that, that, that conviction of like, Hey, this is the first time that we've been able to say, Hey, listen, this thing is tying me to the hamster wheel. And this thing is my potential step away from that. And then one step further, um, is, um, you know, when you talk about politics, because this is being made very political right now, is, you know, do, do I take Bitcoin to the ballot, you know, personally? And I think where I'm at today is simply that that if red or blue is still pro the old system monetary policy, unfortunately, it still doesn't fix, you know, it's still... Um, um proliferates the issue it's still kicking the can it's still fighting the same battle so i think that you know drake is a kind of a prime example of saying like listen like this thing is different and we don't want it to be like this other thing so i guess you know with with this chatter coming back to where do we as um voices in this space Mm -hmm. reach people and touch people on a level that they can they can they can touch because what i see is that so many people are so caught up on this hamster wheel they don't have the time and the space in their system to actually dig into this far enough to adopt it it's a big reason i i started this channel so yeah I mean, bro, for sure. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's why I'm here. A lot of what people see is uh, fear mongering. There's an, I would say right now that we are still in a period where the federal government in the United States is the single biggest threat to U.S. citizens who are investing in Bitcoin. I don't see a threat of Bitcoin becoming valueless on its own over time. Zero threat. Really, the only threat I see in the Bitcoin space as a U.S. citizen is the federal government doing something goofy. Or now, basically suppressing the image of crypto and yeah. Bitcoin for the everyday exactly. user to become like mass adopted, basically. Yeah, people aren't comfortable with it yet. You can you can list the attributes of the US dollar and Bitcoin, and you can do a comparison between the two, and you can see the quality differential. Bitcoin is clearly a flight to safety. It's a flight to quality. However, you've got these existential threats and this bad reputation from the media and the government. I mean, when you have government agencies suing players in a market in mass and you have legislators threatening the asset, it's just good old well, fashioned plain bad PR. The so thing that we have the, to, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so you you really have to look at the phase of evolution of early adopters versus bridging the that chasm bri bridging the gap to the person on the street the mass adaptation so in the big picture i don't see any issues but in the short term we have this big pr problem because of politics yeah yeah i agree with that yeah, um, I, the the nice part is they've been losing you know these lawsuits have not been fruitful yes but we still get the headlines of of we're suing this, we're suing that, and that is negative towards us. I just, you know, I'm going to basically today go on record and 
Have we lost Andy? You're frozen up, Andy. We yeah, Drake. Andy just said, oh, "I want to go on record." And then froze. Of course, am I back? <laughs> You're back. You're so, back now. Okay. All right. I will step back up on my pedestal here. <laughs> and that you know, my hope is that Bitcoin gets to a size that that we start to level the playing field where our monetary policy has to fall in line a little bit more with not only the space of Bitcoin, but also pushing back the other way and that we have a little bit more say in where the money goes and that, you know, there's like this like um, symbiotic relationship between U.S. government and Bitcoiners because, you know what, I want to, I want um a better tomorrow for all of us, my family, myself, you know, I want to make this work. I do. And I think that that is part of this and part of the work that, that I hope to, to do in this space. Yeah. One, one thing I, we probably need to wrap this up here soon, but one thing that I keep looking at is, is BlackRock and their ETFs because love them or hate them, BlackRock is a powerful force and they have only had one day where they've had outflows since the ETFs launch in January. They've had one outflow day on, on BlackRock. The other ETFs are like, wow. you know, having, outflows you know constantly here and there but blackrock seems to have something going on and i think it's i think personally that larry fink and has kind of instructed the advisors to advise their their customers that this is a flight to safety and i i, I mean it's it's the only thing that makes sense to me is that they've convinced their customers that this is a flight to safety that they need to be in. And so they just have not had outflows like any of the ETFs. I don't know. But it's yeah, something, but I, something I watch for sure. And I completely agree. And I think that's part of the solution strategically when you see institutions guiding money towards this asset class it hedges against the political risk right it you, you're not going to get legislation or regulation that squashes the u.s market when you have a player the size of blackrock actively guiding and encouraging investment in it so i i really feel like that we are starting to come out of the the danger area. Like Andy was saying, all these cases that were brought against Bitcoin market participants and the asset class itself of crypto, they've all been losers. Crypto and Bit have won every case. And now we're seeing institutions steer money into the assets through ETFs. Um, I think it's uh, clear skies ahead is the way I feel. It just came out this week that Goldman Sachs, they, they just disclosed that they own almost a half a billion dollars in Bitcoin ETFs. So nice. <laughs> I don't know. Nice. But one more question for you guys before we go. Um, and it goes back to that BlackRock thing. Um, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, movements like Bitcoin and everything um, and and critical mass. And once it hits that critical mass, it just snowballs into mass adoption. So my question is, you know, what are your guys' thoughts? Like, is BlackRock the powerhouse that could make that happen? Just them themselves advising their wealthy clients? like? You know, they get if are they enough to make us reach that critical mass where people actually start paying attention and getting us there? 
Sam, you want to go ahead here? I'm I'm over here snickering. I got a good one for you, but I was waiting for you, Andy. Bro, okay. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. Oh, and he's gone. <laughs> I want to go just... on record right now. Did, oh, did he's I just back. lose connection again? Yeah, you're back now. Wow, I'm a hot mess today. I'm gonna have to figure <laughs> this out. Okay. You know what? I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no. I think that, you know, um, the people, the investors that are in BlackRock already are, are already investing. And basically, they don't have the time to spend 10,000 hours to look into a, a, a company. They just tell their invest in Bitcoin, right? What I think is it's Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift's going to be the critical mask bringer. I think it's, I, I, I hate to, it, it's crazy, right? But I think it's somebody in it's that not space crazy. that has huge, huge influence where they take their entire discography and they put it on blockchain and they say, let's start cutting out these middlemen. And you can now use, you know, two cents, you know, because we can, we can't transact in such low increments. But when we get a massive, beloved, character from pop culture that brings yeah. all of these people that don't otherwise invest in this space into this space bro that is it, criticality that is the I've, criticality of it i feel like you're for sure right as far as like nft ticketing and album yeah. sales and things like that i completely agree with you i don't know if she if Taylor Swift herself brings people into the investing side because Bitcoin isn't really involved in in that. Bitcoin is no, more of the talking about the, adoption, right? Yes. Right. When, exactly. when all of these people that have never transacted or purchased cryptocurrency in any way start yeah. to learn how to use blockchain technology, yeah. that's when the snowball I think. Yes. Andy, Taylor Swift brilliant. is the new Larry Fink. Andrew Whatever. calls it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Andy, that is a brilliant aspect to it. It's it solves that PR problem, doesn't it? It and it gets yeah. the asset into the mass consciousness in a positive way. It does. Well, yeah. <laughs> So some okay. some might say that a big top signal the last cycle was celebrity endorsements of crypto though. So some might see that as a top signal. So <laughs> oh. you never yeah. know. Okay, well let's break it down to retail and commercial. Okay. And Andy, I think you nailed what we'll I'll call the retail, right? The Taylor Swift bringing good publicity and putting good legitimate uses for crypto on the table. That is brilliant. And it's a big part of what we need. What BlackRock brings to the table is every single paycheck, millions of Americans are putting money in their 401k. That is a ginormous recurring revenue stream that's going into direct investment markets. I'm talking about the stock exchange. Let's pick a number. A hundred million dollars a week is going into 401ks. So if BlackRock chips off 2% and steers it to Bitcoin, that's the commercial side of it. So you get Taylor Swift running the front end saying things like, don't worry about the government. I love it. And you can buy my concert tickets with it. That solves the PR problem. BlackRock putting 2% of their ginormous 401k revenue stream into the asset class solves the kind of the bedrock on the the foundational the cash flow problem i mean you're talking about a lot of money that bitcoin or that uh, blackrock has discretion over yeah no one and what, ever... 
what you're talking about um, as far as including a portion of people's 401ks into the Bitcoin ETFs, a yeah. lot of that hasn't really happened yet with BlackRock. That's that's exactly that's what I'm saying. Fidelity it has, has done it. Yet. Fidelity did they did put Bitcoin ETFs as like a two or three percent into one of their other funds. I'm not yes. sure if it's a 401k, but it's when you know when BlackRock starts doing that and putting a small yeah. portion of Bitcoin into their other funds. And there's exactly. no reason that they wouldn't because BlackRock for BlackRock, it was something like 40 or 50% of their inflows in asset management was from the Bitcoin ETFs this year alone. Exactly. Yes. Jeez. Wow. So, however, they're, they may not be intermingling their Bitcoin into their other funds, right? So not yet. Block the 401ks under management by Block BlackRock as they increase their percentage of Bitcoin as an investment for those 401ks, right? It's just like a mutual fund. If you have a 401k, you own a bunch of mutual funds. Well, that mutual funds owns dozens of individual stocks. Is one of those individual positions in that mutual fund, is that a Bitcoin? Not right now, it's not. So BlackRock is steering money into ETFs, but BlackRock is not including those ETFs in their other mutual funds, right? Yep. When they start doing that, it's going to be a huge floodgate. I mean, we are talking about a massive recurring revenue stream where every single two week check or every single one week check or some people get paid monthly. They're withholding money for their 401ks right now that that 401k money is not automatically going into Bitcoin. You can buy Bitcoin ETFs, but BlackRock isn't including those ETFs in their other mutual funds for 401k. So that's the back yep. end of it. The Taylor Swift, you got the front end, but the, there's, so there's still some work to do by BlackRock. They're doing half the work. They've made the ETFs available, but they're not on a scheduled basis doing a recurring revenue stream into Bitcoin. where are you at on it drake um as same, far as same question for you brother as yeah. them yeah. being the force, i could don't they know do it without taylor swift no help from taylor <laughs> i don't know it's hard it's hard to say because i don't know what that critical mass is um but what i do know is you know, BlackRock is the single largest asset manager on the world, in the world. Yeah. And they are just swallowing this stuff up. Yeah. I feel like if Wait. something breaks that way, then that could possibly lead to a much bigger adoption. I don't yes. know if it plays Great. out that way, but I think it could. Right. Right now, BlackRock is facilitating investment in Bitcoin by their ETFs. You can go to BlackRock and choose to invest in Bitcoin through an ETF. You have to make that choice. But just think about it. If you work at Walmart and you have a 401k, if BlackRock is managing that 401k, what are, what are they putting your money into? They're not putting it into Bitcoin right now. So right, BlackRock yeah. is facilitating Bitcoin investment, but they are not driving it actively. Right. Yeah, I love it, Sam. It, it, I love eventually, it. once they do start putting Bitcoin ETFs into these other funds... People are exactly. going to know people 
ordinary people are going to own Bitcoin without even knowing it. Precisely. Well, yeah, that's crazy. That's such right. a good insight. Yes, because right now, me and Erica, we've got two different 401ks. And we have no idea in one of them we manage ourselves. It's all in Bitcoin. The other one, we have no idea what we own. We own <laughs> mutual funds that the the 401k yeah. manager, right, buys for us. It's the mutual funds. So there's kind of the bit BlackRock as a facilitator of Bitcoin investment versus BlackRock as a an active um, driver in that. And right now they're not the active driver. So if they do become that driver and start putting Bitcoin in all of their other funds just to boost it, yeah, that could that could very well be critical mass, uh, a critical yeah, mass and I've never, driver. I, yeah, and I've never heard Taylor as excited with, with about with Taylor anything. with Taylor. Yeah. It's going to be a combined yeah. effort. Larry and Taylor are going to get together and uh, you yeah. know conspire about sending Bitcoin to the moon. <laughs> That's what I'm seeing. <laughs> All right, guys, I, you know, I wanted this, sh this video to be a, a short one. I think we've gone well over what I kind of intended. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap it up with this, but thank you guys again for joining me. Always a pleasure to have you guys here helping me. Um, very yeah, much thanks. appreciated. Thanks guys. Andy, on the last point, you, you mentioned like, how do you educate people? about the quality of Bitcoin and how bad the US dollar is. Like, how do you actually talk to someone and explain to them that they're, the US dollar is working against us and Bitcoin is working for us? I think it goes back to the fundamentals of that, how money is created and how the Federal Reserve is a private organization that's charging the federal government interest on our own money. We need to have a breakout on that. We need to have a breakout session on the Federal Reserve and the U.S. dollar. And why, what is it that's so bad about the U.S. dollar? Why is it taking advantage of us? You know, let's do a yeah. breakout session on that. I love yeah, that. I, I enjoy hearing you speak, Sam. I, you know, I'm actually going to go and rewind this podcast and, and listen again because you have such value to provide. And I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. Let's yeah, plan I, on wait. on one of our next videos uh, together taking that route, Sam. I think that's okay. that's a great yeah, video. I got to book you, just... fellas. I got to go. Let's yep. do it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. And I will yeah. talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Later. Bye-bye. So thank you guys for joining me today. I always appreciate you guys taking out, out time from your day to watch my videos. Hopefully you guys found some of this stuff helpful or insightful. If you guys did, make sure you hit the, the like, subscribe buttons. Um, and as always, guys, I am kind of spotlighting Zend, the Zend Farm Sanctuary. I do have the link to their page in the description, but they're just a small animal sanctu sanctuary that I'm really trying to to put the spotlight on. If you guys want to do something good today, you can go over to their website and donate a few dollars via their Venmo or PayPal. If you do, that's very much appreciated on my end. Um, but I will see you guys in the ne next video. Thanks for joining me today. Bye.